Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this presentation uh, about TIN for the future from International TIN Association. So we're going to look at uh, future opportunities for TIN, in particular focusing on technology opportunities. So there are two major trends, uh, so-called revolutions, that uh, we are uh, in the foothills of, uh, which are going to benefit TIN, we believe. Uh, the first is the fourth industrial revolution, so-called Industry 4.0, as you can see from the uh, picture on the right there. So this is uh, related to communications. So the concept here is that uh, whereas before uh, we have had uh, industry and uh, other things working independently, uh, now we can connect everything together so that everything can talk to everything else, essentially, through through communications, through the so-called Internet of Things, IoT. Uh, so those things might be machines, they might be you and me, they might be um, anything, in fact, your toaster, your washing machine. Uh, so everything is interconnected and everything can talk to each other, receive data. And uh, this can be controlled, uh, understood, interpreted by artificial intelligence. So uh, this is the... Uh, so-called fourth industrial revolution that we are on the brink of, and uh, it will bring huge changes to the way that we live and uh, our uh, lifestyles and our industries. Um, and of course, the good news for tin is that tin uh, as solder is the glue that will connect everything um, together. So we see this as a huge potential uh, for tin markets in the future. The second is the so-called green industrial revolution. So this is connected with energy principally. So as we all know, climate change is a huge um, driver uh, that is imminent and uh, needs to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and needs to work on ways to make our planet greener, mainly by converting it to an electricity-based, electrical-based economy. And uh, that's a technology-led revolution, as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, plenty of technologies required for solar cells, wind power, energy storage, and so on, uh, and is also including electric vehicles to, to reduce uh, emissions, plus also other technologies and concepts around recycling, uh, circular economies, and other policy-led initiatives to essentially make our planet into a greener and cleaner planet for the next generations. And this also is good news for tin, tin as you may know, is very technically diverse and can do lots of very interesting things, technically including in most of the, these uh, technologies you see on the, the right hand side there, uh, actually. And so we do see this uh, as a opportunity for TIN uh, into the future going forward. And uh, we can give you some more details of that uh, in later slides in the presentation. But before we talk about uh, some of the technologies specifically related to the, those things, I'd like to first mention some technology drivers related to the solder market in general, uh, which we've been looking at for some time. Two in particular, uh, electronics miniaturization and lead-free conversion. So as far as electronics miniaturization has been concerned, we've seen over the last decade or more uh, the transition really from uh, larger uh, equipment to miniaturized equipment, as you can see in the example of the mobile phone there, which we all well know on the top left. Uh, in practical terms, this has uh, meant for solder joints, as you can see in the picture on the right, that solder joint technology has, has changed, uh, evolving from the larger so-called through-hole joints, where the pin goes all the way through the board, and uses quite a lot of solder, to this, uh, what you see there in the picture, a very small amount of solder called SMT, or surface mount technology. So we've watched the transition uh, over the last decade, and uh, especially in China, uh, in fact, and so this chart on the left here illustrates how we've been tracking that. So it's an index graph uh, over the last decade of uh, solder use and uh, of semiconductor shipments. You can see the semiconductor shipments there in red, growing at about about 4%, which is typical of electronics industry. Semiconductor shipments are an indicator for, for uh, solder use. Uh, but we can see, despite that, that tin in solder itself, as in blue line there, has been really remarkably flat over the last decade mainly because of miniaturization. So if we divide 
one by the other. You can see that in the gray line underneath, which is so-called tin intensity index. You can see there uh, how that change really has impacted tin use in solders over the last decade. And in general, as you can see, the index has come down from about 100 to about 50. It means in real terms that about half as much tin is used per circuit board today as was used 10 or more years ago. The good news for tin, though, as you can see there, is that that uh, intensity of use curve seems to be flattening now. Uh, and if that is true and continues to be true, then we would expect uh, miniaturization effect to, to fade, essentially. Uh, and then the electronics use in solder would grow, start to grow uh, back to the match more closely. The, the semiconductor growth you see there of about 4% going into the future it would start restart uh, its, its growth. Uh, there will still be some long term impact, but it will be uh, much less. The second uh, technological uh, factor that we've been watching quite closely uh, over the years has been the conversion to lead free solder in electronics. As most of you know, this was uh, legislation, uh, regulation driven technology change. As you can see on the slide on the left there, the uh, global average of uh, lead free solder use in electronics over the last decade has been on average pretty flat at 65%. Uh, until very recently when, as we would expect, it's begun to rise again. And uh, that is uh, related to the uh, expanded regulations, related to uh, the availability of leaded components and other factors. So we are starting to see now that uh, that upturn uh, measured last at about 74% last year. And if we speculate that, uh, that will continue and as we expect and perhaps go to 100% to or close to 100% by 2030, we can calculate roughly uh, a figure of about 20,000 or more tin, tons of tin uh, that are involved uh, in that transition, which is not insignificant uh, in uh, the uh, small world of tin and solder. So those two technology changes uh, are already happening and would have happened without the technology changes that we're about to discuss, uh, in fact. Talking more specifically now uh, about the um, digital revolution in particular, uh, First thing to note is that 5G uh, is going to lead this new electronics era. 5G will be the platform for that connected future. It's necessary because uh, of the fast speeds available uh, with 5G uh, to support that huge amount of data transfer. And uh, so we know that China is leading uh, at the moment with 500,000 base stations built. Uh, these are just beginning uh, to be implemented across the world in 2020, 2021 is the year of launch essentially of, of 5G. Uh, and uh, so we are anticipating, not immediately, but eventually download speeds will be something like 30 times more than they are today. Uh, and China, we know, is already looking forward to, to 6G, in fact, the very next generation. So uh, this is the, of key importance, the, the platform of, of 5G for supporting and enabling the new technology era. In terms of how it's going to impact TIN, uh, what we're looking for here is essentially initially uh, the infrastructure build, which we see in two phases. If you look at the diagram on the top left there, you can see uh, macro uh, is indicated there, base stations, and those are the pretty well the existing 4G base stations, which are being converted right now to, to 5G. We don't see a huge initial um, boost for TIN in that conversion, mainly because a lot of that is even so big as doing with, with, uh, with software, in fact. But it's the next phase, the uh, phase to, to micro, as you can see there uh, in purple, which we do expect will have uh, some Im impact for tin use, uh, because uh, the one thing to note about 5G is that the range of the signal is much shorter. It's a more powerful signal, but it's shorter. And so you need more base stations. And that's where the micro stations come in. Uh, they are smaller but more about triple, about triple the density of uh, the macro stations. And it's that phase of build of these micro stations, which you will see uh, down, the, down the road, micro stations, that will um, boost tin use somewhat. And then built on that platform, the third phase, uh, as we've already mentioned, billions of IoT and other smart devices will be enabled. New data centers, computing, artificial intelligence, all that will be built on top of that platform. And that's where we expect to see the major benefit uh, in the longer term. 2025-2030. Electric vehicles is uh, something everyone's talking about uh, and will certainly be a part of this uh, transition. And we can see there pointed on the left uh, the kind of data that uh, everyone is looking at just now with the 
global internal combustion engine figures in blue, uh, transitioning over time to 2030 for the battery electric vehicles, the BEVs, um, and uh, about about 30 uh, percent share by 2030. Uh, PHEVs are the are the hybrids, plug-in hybrids in black there, which will play some some role. So we see that moving very fast uh, uh, all the time. Governments are now setting deadlines for uh, internal combustion engine bans, essentially. And so there's a very strong drive, especially in Europe, uh, but also moving fast in China. In terms of how that's going to impact tin use, it's still early days, I must say. Uh, it's true to say that so auto electronics are already at a very high level of growth. Uh, so you will know that uh, there's huge amounts of electronics already going into cars, new control systems, new safety systems, new communica communication systems, and so on. Uh, and so that has been that has been powering away. And uh, had it not been for miniaturisation, we'd have seen an even bigger benefit to Tim already. Um, but if you're looking at the question of um, the impact for EV, the table on the bottom left there gives some ideas of the amount of electric electronics in electric vehicle compared to a conventional car and just looking at the basic numbers there uh, it, it seems we're talking about factors of five or, or six even uh, perhaps in terms of electronics content certainly in terms of value um, and so at this stage that's all, all we can really say in terms of indicators for the uh, benefits to tin uh, you can do the math uh, in, your, in your head if you like but uh, essentially it obviously works out to be more tin and substantial amounts perhaps um, and on top of the electronics benefit, uh, we also see uh, some increasing interest in, in copper tin components. So those are electrical bus bars, things like tin, bronze wires, electrical connectors and so on, which will also be part of the electrical uh, systems inside um, electric vehicles. So there's another area there that we uh, certainly expect to benefit from electric vehicles. That's an area, obviously, that we're going to be keeping a very close eye on, getting more definition about the impact as, as, we, get, as we learn more. So in terms of technologies that support uh, climate change uh, work, we can see that really they fall into different groups. Uh, the main group uh, certainly of interest for us at the moment is tin technologies for energy storage, essentially um, batteries. In fact, tin is already benefiting uh, from this uh, because we know that a small amount of tin is used in lead acid batteries here, about 0.8, 1.3% uh, in the grids of batteries. Uh, and those lead acid markets are still growing uh, and expected to grow still at about 2% 2, 2 growth indefinitely, even though electric vehicles are coming along and uh, lithium ion too. In fact, tin is already benefiting uh, specifically because of start-stop technology. So start-stop vehicles, which are the main uh, production now, especially in Europe, require high performance lead acid batteries. And those high performance batteries are the ones which have extra tin. And so we see opportunities now for, for tin in start-stop markets, new markets in, in the US just beginning, um, potentially in truck markets. We will see more, um, more traction there for, for tin, advanced lead acid there. In terms of lithium ion, which is the competitive technology, although in fact it, can probably, it will probably be complementary, in fact, to lead acid in electric vehicles, interestingly. But certainly lithium ion um, batteries are advancing fast. Uh, we follow the uh, R&D. Uh, every month, I'm finding at least 20 papers, I should say, every month uh, on uh, tin in lithium-ion batteries, especially from, from China. The R&D is and has been prolific, prolific for quite a while. Uh, technologically, tin uh, improves the conductivity of the um, anode and electrolyte. And as you're hearing a lot, you will hear a lot about silicon in lithium-ion batteries. Um, I know Tesla announced that recently. Well, tin alongside silicon is synergistic, so uh, we may not hear about it so much, but tin uh, certainly works well with silicon uh, as an additive. And we've seen some very interesting uh, work recently coming out from uh, various places on tin foils uh, used in the anode. Uh, at the moment, the anode is a copper foil uh, with carbon, uh, but in fact, uh, the whole assembly could be replaced by, by tin. So those papers are interesting and uh, we're watching that space very closely to see uh, if we can find any evidence of, of commercial uh, use. And we'll certainly let you know when we see that. But uh, beyond that, the uh, next generation uh, of technology uh, is even more likely to use tin. Um, 
what we're referring to there is specifically is sodium ion batteries, uh, specifically or even potassium ion batteries, which are cheaper and obviously safer than lithium. Uh, and until now, their performance has been less. Uh, but more recently, we're looking at some R&D which uses tin. Uh, and uh, the latest paper, which we just um, going to publish on our website, uh, shows that uh, a sodium ion battery can get close at least to matching lithium ion performance with tin. So we're quite interested in the sodium ion area, um, certainly. Tin has also been evaluated for other types of batteries. So flow batteries or vanadium flow batteries and liquid metal batteries are large, uh, giant batteries that will be used for utility electric storage. So that means when you're using uh, solar cells or wind power, it's intermittent. You need to balance that power. So you need big batteries to, to, to uh, work in that utility grid system. And it's that, those kind of technologies which, which we're talking about. Uh, and certainly TIN has featured in uh, R&D for the, both of those types of batteries, either as a promoting additive or, in fact, as the core, core technology. So we're following that area um, too. So I think energy storage certainly is the most interesting area. It's not the only one uh, because energy generation is also a part of the story here. So this is the concept of how tin can convert sunlight or uh, energy, heat energy or other sources into electricity. And uh, we're well familiar with uh, solar cell technology, but the newer generation of solar cells will look for cheap or earth abundant elements like tin uh, to to replace existing technologies which are uh, use expensive or rare elements. Uh, and so the new generation tin perovskites or perovskite materials are extremely interesting uh, for, for us. Um, tin is used as one of the alternatives alongside lead often or, or CZTS, which is copper zinc tin sulfide materials. So these are very thin layers of materials. You can see the diagram on the top left there in red, uh, red layer. But also inside these kind of cells, uh, we're seeing uh, other tin oxide, conductive tin oxide layers, ITO, FTO um, layers. This is the kind of technology you'll see on buildings, on, on windows, for example, invisible layers that will generate electricity from sunlight. That's where I think this will go. Uh, and, the, and if you look on the photograph there, you'll see the team from Nanjing University, uh, which is about to put an article on our website about their work because they're showing you uh, their latest perovskite uh, material, which has an efficiency of 24.3%, which is actually truly remarkable. And it, it does bring close to very close to existing technologies. So we're quite keen on that story. Uh, and uh, we mustn't forget that um, in uh, solar cell technology, it's not just the active materials, but also other materials. So, uh, for example, solar cells, the glass solar cells are joined together with copper, copper tin connectors. It's a copper ribbon coated in tin, for example. Uh, plus, obviously, you've got electronics associated with with the uh, control systems and so on. So, so in general, the solar cell area, which is growing very fast right now, especially in China, is an interesting area for tin, for sure. Bottom left there, uh, you can see a picture of a thermoelectric device. So thermoelectricity is uh, energy harvesting from heat and uh, you need materials like tin to, to do that. So tin selenide or tin selenium uh, is theoretically the, the best uh, material in the world uh, on paper to convert energy, heat energy to electricity. And we're seeing some interesting developments um, certainly there. 60% of US energy is lost as waste heat. So you can already see immediately the potential for these thermoelectric materials uh, on factories, car exhausts, other places where heat is lost. And tin may well play a role there in that energy conversion. So we're keen to look at, keep looking at thermoelectrics. And thirdly, uh, certainly by no means lastly, uh, tin could be a part of the hydrogen economy. So there are many ways to produce hydrogen and uh, some of those newer ways uh, involve tin potentially. So there's a lot of R&D around tin use in producing hydrogen in various ways. There are tin catalysts, for example, tin sulfides or variant tin oxides, that uh, if you put them in water in sunlight, they'll bubble and produce hydrogen. They'll split the water. And that's quite interesting, I would say. And when you've uh, done that, you can make uh, electricity back from hydrogen using, using fuel cells. Or in fact, you can use various organic materials in fuel cells. And picture in the bottom right there, you can see it's the green algae in test tubes. And we just published that article on our website too, 
because it's a very interesting piece of work using tin copper, tin copper catalysts in algae from polluted rivers, actually, uh, and it's converting it to electricity. Uh, and that we see also as a very interesting, very uh, green development, uh, which tin is, can play a key part. So we're watching all this R&D very carefully uh, and uh, hopeful for some uh, tin use definitely from this in the future. Um, <clears throat> alongside that, we're also looking at new electrical infrastructures, obviously supporting all this uh, renewable energy distribution systems from uh, for wind and solar power, for example. Uh, and that will reconfigure or rechange you know, utility networks to be, uh, as I mentioned before, more localized, more decentralized with giant batteries for for uh, serving local communities, uh, perhaps. And uh, so that all has to be rebuilt and re rewired. Obviously, we've got to have vehicle charging infrastructures built all over the world, 40 million plus charging ports at least 2030. And all those have to be interconnected with electrical interconnection and electronic control systems. And as we said before, tin, tin glues all that together. Now you see some specific examples there uh, of tin copper materials, tin copper bus bars, uh, braids, wires, um, connectors. Those are all materials uh, containing tin. And it's an area that we're going to be keeping an eye on uh, going forward to see what uh, impact it has on their use as we see these new uh, infrastructures being, being built with. Another area that we are watching uh, closely but comes uh, into a very complex technical area is electronic materials. So there is a huge amount of R&D on this. I pick out 30, 40, 50 papers a month perhaps on new electronic materials for, for tin. Uh, this is uh, zinc tin oxide for wearables, flexible displays, that kind of thing, transparent transistors, um, tin sulfides. Uh, these are materials, complex materials used inside uh, silicon chips and other components for semiconductors. Germanium tin is one that keeps cropping up, and this is actually a material that can be used to, for, uh, for lasers uh, to produce light for photonics. And if you've never heard of photonics, it's, it's the uh, technology that's going to replace electronics. It's going to use light instead of electricity in, in circuit boards uh, in the future. And so, so that's an interesting um, development. Germanium tin products and barium tin there and some display devices will substitute indium tin, for example. So that I don't expect that any of these developments in particular will consume huge quantities of tin, but I think what this indicates to me is that uh, certainly an important part of the future tin market will be high tech uses like this, small quantity, but high value tech uses, uh, where it's pushing the limits of, um, for example, high purity uh, and physical form, perhaps in, in uh, sputtering targets and other things. I see this, this is where, uh, where this market is going. And there's an opportunity for higher value, low tonnage uh, products, I think. Um, lastly, I'll talk briefly about tin technologies for a greener planet. Uh, and there are several of these. Um, so carbon capture is an area uh, that is uh, in the focus and will become more important in focus to come. Uh, so car there's far too much carbon dioxide, as we know, in the environment. And that is all being captured from factories and other places and stored in uh, various ways. But obviously it's better rather than just to store it if you can convert it to useful products. And so there's uh, plenty of work on that, uh, which includes tin. Tin is quite interesting in that regard. So tin copper uh, particularly can, can do that. So there are lots of R&D converting CO2 into compounds, specifically in the case of tin, the usual compound is formate, uh, a formate compound. And that's used for dyeing, printing, food additives and other, any of other applications. And so I think the tin will certainly play a part in helping the world to, to achieve that net, net zero emissions that we're all headed for. Water treatment technologies are another area that, uh, that's come on the radar more recently, although it's been around in principle for a while. So if you put tin into uh, uh, water with a pollutant, say a dye or some other organic material using sunlight, it will uh, break up the organic material and uh, chemically uh, remove it. Uh, that's very interesting. There's a lot of papers coming out on that too. More recently, we've been talking to a company called AMS, who are um, producing stannous ions uh, from uh, electrical treatments of tin, tin uh, ingots, tin, tin rods. And uh, that, those stannous ions go into solution and then they interact with other pollutants like chromium, lead, arsenic, other things like that, uh, to take them out of solution. They've got a big project in California on uh, chromium 
removal from drinking water, for example. So that's another area you can, if you visit our website, you'll see some information about that too. And lastly to mention uh, is tin recovery from, from waste uh, in many different ways, but uh, the largest is electronics, waste electronics. Uh, and uh, we've certainly spent a lot of time looking at this area and there's uh, some very interesting new work coming out now. Uh, new technologies for developing um, ways to recover solder from solder joints. If you look at the picture on the bottom left, uh, not many people realize that uh, there is in fact tin on waste circuit boards. Um, sometimes you have to show them, but there is about 3% uh, tin, you can see it there, on uh, waste circuit boards. And there's a big opportunity there to, to recover that tin if you could get the technology right and the economics. So companies like EnviroLeach in the US have a new chemistry uh, to do that. And in the last couple of weeks, we've been talking to Coventry University in the UK, and they're looking at um, new bioleaching routes that to remove it with, with bacteria, in fact. Uh, that's a very interesting piece of work. So those are the areas, I think, where tin can certainly help to, uh, to clean up the planet. Lastly, uh, how does all that uh, then compute into a demand forecast? Uh, extremely difficult uh, to say, uh, but this is our um, statement at the moment. So looking over the last decade, you can see that tin has been growing, oscillating around the GDP fluctuations at about 2%. You can see that on the dotted blue line there. And in fact, that is close to the long term growth of, of tin. If you look over the last well, nearly century, you'll find uh, 2% is a standard long term growth rate for tin. Uh, mostly that recently has been driven by, by growth in, in China and the Chinese economy. Uh, then, we, as we can all know, uh, there's been this huge double whammy in 2019, 2020, firstly of the US trade war, secondly now of the pandemic, although in fact, as it's been said, tin hasn't done that badly after the pandemic. There's been various reasons why it's been boosted. But we do expect uh, if uh, there's a clear window uh, for tin to bounce strongly back in 2021, uh, we hope. Uh, and there's plenty of upside in the market there, as you can see already. Uh, and we expect then when tin does come back, that the growth rate will start to move up towards that, uh, that red line, which, which is about 4% growth mainly because of uh, 5G and some of the other developments we've talked about uh, coming along in electronics area and solder use particularly. Uh, so we see the growth rate drifting towards towards 4% and uh, that's our baseline forecast. Uh, so that's probably without many of the longer term uh, technology uh, developments we expect um, later on. I think probably most of those will be in the 2025, 2030 timescale perhaps and will add to this forecast if they come about. Uh, but obviously all of this is subject to a huge amount of uncertainty. Uh, and so uh, the, we can say in summary that uh, the potential could be potentially huge, um, but uh, we wouldn't at this time, I don't think many people would forecast beyond, beyond 2025 uh, in the current climate. So I hope that's useful and interesting and certainly feel free to come back to us uh, with any questions. Please check out our uh, website, which has got a section on new technologies where a lot of this is given in more detail. Thank you very much.